As we go through our lives, we are helped by others and we help others. And the ratio of that helping is very important. It's very important for society as a whole. Oliver Sacks in his book, Gratitude, states as he was nearing his death that he was grateful for the people who had helped them, but he was also grateful for the people who had allowed him to help them. I was in the Army in 1968, and the Army sent me to Vietnam. I was assigned to the 93rd of AC. Also, I was a liaison between the 93rd of AC and the medevac attachment. These are the helicopters that went to pick up the wounded and the people who were injured in battle. They were transported to our hospital and we had to divide them into three groups. The first group, American servicemen, and we treated them in our hospital. The second were the Vietnamese servicemen, and we sent them to Saigon. And the Vietnamese civilians were destined to go to another hospital. As luck would have it, I treated the commander of forces at Doc Tho. The two commanding generals of all the Allied forces in Vietnam came to visit him every day, and I had to stand there because I was his doctor. I thought, how can I get something out of this? I had gone over to that other hospital where the Vietnamese civilians were supposed to be sent, and it was not satisfactory. So I asked those two generals if I could treat the Vietnamese civilians in our hospital. There was a lot of meetings, and I was given a whole Quonset hut to treat the Vietnamese. I am very grateful to all the people who helped. The nurses scrubbed and circulated in surgery because we had to do everything to help these people. We had to put implants in or whatever it took to stabilize the fractures. Nurses helped on the ward. Anesthesia helped. The Viet Cong must have heard about this because they quit hitting our hospital with rockets. There was a 10-year-old boy that came in with napalm burns over his leg. He couldn't bend his knee, and he was stuck at about 45 degrees. So I took an x-ray to be sure that he didn't have a fracture. There was no fracture. And I told them that we would have to manipulate his knee, which means bend it as far as it would go and then push on it, and it would hurt. And I told him I would stop when he told me to stop. So we worked on this, and about three months later, he had full motion of his knee and he could walk well. The Vietnamese have a jungle telegraph. That means that the civilians can pass word about something along the communication lines. So we sent word to his parents that he was ready to go home. The father came after a long bus ride and picked him up, and it was a joyful reunion of father and son. The father gave me a mango. His thumbprint was in it because he had ridden the bus a long way. And I looked at that mango, and I looked at that father and son walk away, and I thought, this is the greatest gift I've ever received. I then started working in an orphanage that treated disabled children. My wife was a pediatrician, and she was also a developmental pediatrician, which means she took care of disabled children. These were North Vietnamese nuns who ran this orphanage, and they were a joy to work with. One day, they came to tell me that the VC had come in the back and they were looking for me. I went out the front and returned in two days to thank the nuns. They were not there. 
I have never been so dejected in my entire life. After my service in Vietnam, I came home. I was still in the Army, and I asked the Army if I could go back and take care of civilians. The Army said no, but I could go to Indonesia. So I went to Jakarta and gave lectures about fracture treatment for five years. I went for a month every year for five years. I then went to visit one of the surgeons in Sumatra. And as we were making rounds, we came upon the man in the bed. This man had been there for three years. He was very dejected. His family had quit coming to see him because they couldn't afford the small hospital charges. He had a fracture of his femur, which orthopedic surgeons know how to take care of. I asked the surgeon, why didn't you operate on him and take care of his femur? The surgeon said, he can't afford an implant. And I realized at the time that I had wasted one month out of every year for five years. I thought about this, and we knew we had to do the innovation in the environment that they had available. They did not have x-ray in the operating room. We have x-rays called C-arms here, which give instant images. They didn't have electricity because they had power surges. So we worked on butcher bones to find a way to place the screws through the slots of the nail, through the bone. This had to be done, as I mentioned, without x-ray. So we developed a system of slot finders. When these go into the slot of the nail, you can see I turn and it stops. And we know that's the interlocking hole in the nail. So therefore, we place a screw through it to hold it. This is done very frequently. And the result is a nail called an IM nail with screws going through the slots of the nail, which is a very stable fixation. That was 25 years ago, and that was the beginning of SIGN. SIGN is now in 57 countries. We've done 410,000 cases now, just the poor around the world. We have a database which they report to to get replacements, so we send the proper sizes. But this also gives us a good accounting for our implants. And it gives us ideas that we should follow to improve our implants and make new implants. So this is a story of helping people and being helped by people. And we all have a similar story in our life. Thank you.